Guys, another Founder Wisdom pod with Paul F. Cronin today, M&A edition. As he an M&A advisor, mergers and acquisition at True North Advisor Group, LLC. Paul, welcome to the pod. Excited to talk about M&A with you today. Tell us a bit more about yourself. Tell us about your business. Oh, well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, yeah, so my background before I got into m is I've owned a few companies, uh, before my entrepreneurial career, um, I worked in the wholesale manufacturing world for many, many years and joined a small company. We grew that to almost $100 million in revenue and had an exit. Um, and my three companies that I own, one was a data in- analytics business. Another was um, a golf instruction uh, business. Not that I'm an instructor. I've always been a biz guy. Uh, so that was very fun to be in the golf world. Um uh, and then I spent about 10 years doing exit planning. You know, I had a partner in there. And so we really worked with business owners, sort of figuring out what they wanted to accomplish, what they wanted to do with the business and what they wanted to do with their life afterwards. Um, and it was sort of part through that business that I kind of got the nickname, the what's next guy, because I help business owners figure out what's next for the business, and what's next for their life. Um, and then in more recent years, I've been doing transaction work. Um, so here at True North Advisors, we work with what I would call small to medium-sized businesses. Uh, in the U.S., we refer to them um, typically as somewhere between like five million to fifty million. We tend to be, you know, more in that five to twenty-five million is sort of our sweet spot. Uh, but almost any industry and pretty much anywhere in the U.S. Interesting. I want to start with um, the golf training part because uh, you and I shared uh, that same passion. I guess um, indoor golfing is so fun, you know, like just smashing a golf ball in that screen. Uh, even when there's, you know, like snow outside, um, then you can have a beer. So it's pretty cool. And um, yeah, I, I don't know why, but if I would rest- have to restart, you know, a physical business, maybe it, it would be in that field. Um, I pulled up a business idea the other day that, you know, like I would do the, the hardware, uh, installation and so forth, but also I would have a software cost, you know, and I would add to these indoor, uh, training machine, uh, gamification so that you could make some bets with your friends. Uh, I don't know, bet 50 bucks and I would take, uh, 10% of that as the software. So tell us about your, your time doing that and tell us about, uh, the economics behind these businesses yeah it was a fascinating business so we had built um i think half a dozen of them in different places uh and each of them were in various stages of trying to figure out how to cash flow quite frankly um so um the economics and and i sold my stake in the business in uh in 2008 i got my money in july of 08 i was quite lucky um obviously everything bad happened that fall and being a startup, that company was continually burning cash, trying to figure out the business model. And so they, they unfortunately didn't make it. But what I would say that the, the fundamental challenges to that business are, depending on where you are in North America, um, the business is most popular, of course, when golf courses are closed, right? Uh, or when the driving ranges are closed, for that matter. Um The other big challenge to the business is, although people in the golf instruction side Here, golfers tell them, I want to get better. I want to get better. The truth is most business owners, excuse me, most golfers really aspire to become better golfers, but will never do the work and don't want to pay much money for it, which is why there's very little money in golf instruction. Um, Here's a fun fact. Uh, According to the National Golf Association, National Golf Foundation, rather, that does a lot of research on the industry, the most profitable part of the golf industry are driving ranges. Because when you think about it, they're just renting golf balls. (laughs) So so to the economics of indoor, um, many of them, of course, you're hitting into golf bays, right? Just the practice nets. Um, And that's fine. You can kind of you know, do it for half an hour or so or hit a small bucket. But if you want the more sophisticated piece where you're dealing with hitting into the uh, virtual golf, um, those are based on a per hour basis. Um, 
and there's only so many hours and you can only have typically a maximum of four golfers for one of those spots. So you, how do you get the economics right of, of charging enough per hour per golfer to make money? And where virtually everybody in that industry today has really gone to a model of you don't, you don't make money on the golf. You make all your money with the beer and food, basically. So, so it's really what I would say indoor golf is fundamentally about entertainment. So if you can get the right economics of you know, making enough money from food and beverage, the golf really is just uh, becomes, it's kind of like having a, a restaurant at a scenic overlook, right? People, people like the idea of the scenic overlook, but how you make money is on, on that. Now, the gambling piece that you mentioned is interesting because people who golf typically, you know, all these guys, I don't know, well, maybe women too, um, will have something on the match, right? A bet on the match of some kind. So there might be a place where, you know, will people, you know, set up a golf amongst their foursome and they will bet? And could you have a tournament where people are golfing simultaneously around the world, hitting it, everything's tracked online, you can see the results. Um, assuming people aren't cheating on golf. Um, and so there could be a way of aggregating that, um, that gambling uh, piece. But, but as I say, is it isn't about golf. It's really about gambling, right? It isn't about golf. It's really about food and beverage or what I would call entertainment. So if, as long as you have that mentality that it, this is really about entertainment and you have the capacity to properly manage an entertainment business, golf just becomes kind of the, the vehicle for that right i would include in those systems as well the ordering of food i take a cut of that i would also have bets not only against other players but hey if you can do this whole uh, under like four shots you bet against the casino you bet you bet against the game and you win ten dollars if you do that that hold under four if you don't then i get the ten dollars you know um, and the casino, like winning 90% of the time, then I, I think I'd make a good cash from that. And finally, I'd also have sponsors in the game, like uh, Titleist and, um, you know, the Nike and, and all these brands, um, Cobra, so that they could yeah drive some more uh, dollars uh, from the advertisement. Um, you went from golf um, and then you started as a business coach. You seem to have been in coaching for quite a while. How is business coaching for you? And do you still do it up to this day or did you just um, like stop coaching? Yeah, so um, I don't do too much formal coaching anymore. The, the kind that I tend to do today um, and it's really periodic is really more on that exit piece. So um, like a most recent engagement was um, another advisor came to me and asked uh, me to work with their client. Their client owned a business. They were in the process of doing an M&A engagement with another firm. Um, but the gentleman who owned the company was sort of emotionally stuck, right? Like, I, what am I going to do on Monday after I sell my business kind of a thing? And is this the right option? And so my process, um, which I use under the brand, the Platinum Years, I still have that out there, um, that really breaks it down, right? It breaks it down, you know, where what is holding you back? What are some fears? What are your hopes? What are your aspirations for what I call this life as you're leaving? Um, and then I also walk them through the actual various uh, exit options. Is it a third-party sales, an internal you know, is, is it going to the employees? Um, so I kind of work through all of those pieces, not so much from the legal or the tax type of implications, because I'm not, I'm neither an accountant or a lawyer, but really more in terms of, is this the right business decision and is this the right personal decision? Um, and it's a very programmatic uh, some approach where I, I will take somebody over usually um, a, a three month engagement. It can be four or five, you know, if the case may be. But the goal is really to get that business owner in a place where this is my plan. This is what I'm going to do. This is why I'm going to do it. And this is the life I want to lead afterwards. Um, beyond that, I mean, it, you know, I'm, I'm doing a consulting engagement with a um, 
a VC backed startup in New York, but it's really more M and A related as opposed to they they are paying me for business advice, but it's really M and A business advice. So. So I can understand the uh, emotionally stuck folks. Although like me, I always make sure to have options as an entrepreneur. And since I build everything virtually and I almost start a bit one business a day, you know, like I, me, I'm an options guy. So I, I never be like kind of stuck when it comes to selling my business um, by nature. But uh, I can definitely understand someone that wouldn't want to, sign an NDA saying like, okay, you can do this, you can't do that. That would be very restrictive for entrepreneurs. So how much is that of a non-selling cause when it comes to selling your business? Is it, because I guess a bunch of folks are not um, capable or are not eligible to start the, their business because they don't have a business, you know, they're like themselves in the business and uh, they 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 don't have any processes. They don't have employees, so they 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 can't sell. Or their business is incredibly unattractive from a financial perspective. Once once you've jumped over that hurdle and you're eligible to sell your business, what can stop you from selling your business? Um, so a couple of things come to mind. One is um, price expectations that are out of alignment. Um, most m a advisors would tell you that's probably the number one reason a deal won't come to pass. Um, you know, the seller thinks the business is worth four million. Um, the buyer likes the business, goes to get some financing. The bank uh, does an appraisal of the business, of course, and the business comes in at three million. And then the, now the business owner is insulted, right? So, wow, you're cutting you're cutting the price by a million. You don't understand the value worth. The buyer isn't opposed to four million. It's just that the bank is saying it's not worth four million. And 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 you know, I just did a blog post about this of smaller dollar levels where, you know, interest rates, particularly here in the US, have climbed, you know, dramatically. And it's not, not unusual for a business, small business loan today be to be in the ten to eleven percent range. Well, even a year or two years ago, it was more like six or seven percent. And that that gap that that diff, that uh, delta um, has has truly changed the financing options. So, like much like buying a house, if interest rates go up, something's got to give. Price has got to give. Terms have got to give. Um, so, a business owner may have to lower the price, or if they really believe that's the correct price, and the bank is saying no, you, it's three million is what we're going to do. That million dollar gap has to be made up somehow. Right. It could be seller financing, it could be an earn out, whatever the case may be, but they may have to wait a really, really long time, years to get that incremental million that they think the business is worth. But the bank is saying it's not financeable. Right. Um, are baby boomers still selling businesses? Are Gen X and Gen Z buying right now? And how do you see First, this trend, the aging of population um, with the trends of the current inflation, AI, and the current state of economy, how is that going to impact uh, the selling and the buying of business uh, in 2023 and 2024? Sure. So in the short term, I'm not too worried about AI impacting um, uh, business sales, but broadly speaking, m and uh, long term, I think it will have some pretty dramatic increase uh, impact. So short term, um, you know, I'm a baby boomer. I'm in the tail end, um, early 60s. Um, you know, we're not getting any younger, right? So our, you know, so with the back aches and the hip, hip hip aches and everything else that you know physically people are worn down, but then psychologically people are worn down, emotionally people are worn down, right? Where they've survived. Think of everything what boomers have gone through in the last, about business ownership in the last 30 years, right? You know, from the end of the Cold War, so that changed a lot of business models. Then you had the financial crisis. Um, you had 9-11, um, you know, currently, you know, a terrible war in Europe. And all of these various changes, um, tremendous disruption, obviously, that's occurred. Um, but we're still getting older. Like the inevitable isn't going to change, right? Every single business owner will leave their business someday. And they really have two options. They can plan for it on their terms or let other people plan it for them, 
right? Um, and in terms of the buying side, um, I I get calls every single week, multiple calls often from people in their 30s and 40s, sometimes even their 20s, and they want to buy a business for one of two reasons. One is um, they know it's hard to get funding now for startups, right? Uh, but if they find a business that's you know generating 300,000 in profit or 500,000 in profit, they can, and they've got decent credit themselves, then they can get a cash flow loan here in the U.S. from a you know, small business um, um, administration. And if they can pull together 10% um, between their 10% and the seller doing 10% financing, the SBA will do the other 80%, you know, based upon the financial metrics. So there's a, still a tremendous amount of demand. The other demand is for businesses uh, and specifically business owners who are looking for growth through acquisition, right? So their the growth of their business, organic growth, may have you know stopped the geographic limitation, people limitations, what have you. Um, the classic example would be somebody who's in the home services business, you know, plumbing, heating, what have you. And, you know, in their geography, you know, they could do three million a year. Um, so their capacity to grow really requires them to hire people and staff. And it's often just far more efficient to buy somebody. You know, if you have 10 trucks, 10, 10 service techs, it's rather than trying to put somebody else out of business, take their business, you buy their business and you buy their trucks and you're buying their people, and their customer list. So those trends haven't changed um, if we go into some sort of a severe recession, obviously that may. Uh, and then the third element, of course, private equity uh, is enormous out there still. Um, they got a lot of capital deployed, trillions of dollars. And even at this smaller level, there's many people who are, who are starting boutique private equity firms. So I don't see that changing. Um, I can talk to you about some of my long-term predictions on AI if you want to, but Hundred percent. Yeah, we're all about AI here. Um, talk about that like for uh, probably a minute or two because yeah. after that I've got questions about starting my own business brokerage firm or M and A M and A firm uh, for you. Sure. So AI, where I so this sort of um, if you think in the classic M and A model, a lot of it is very opaque, right? So let's start with business valuations, right? So today, if you want to know the value of your business, you typically have to pay somebody to uh, generate a valuation, one that could be used for negotiation, right? Uh, which is what a lot of M&A type people will do or business brokers will do, create a valuation using standard metrics and processes. And they charge for that, which, which they should. Um, but if you're a very small business and you're not sure you want to sell, how do you do that? Well, AI. Right. So so there is a company right now in New York called Baton, and they're creating the, the Zillow for small business valuation. Every business owner should know it. They're doing hundreds of these and they do them for free. That's going to change a lot of people's business model. The other part that I would say quickly is in creating the marketing materials, also known as a confidential information memorandum, SIM. All right. Well, Again, people put that together, they often charge that as part of their fees. Well, if you can use large language models and various forms of AI, you can essentially ask a, ask a system to assemble a SIM for a plumbing company, right? Or assemble the SIM for, um, you know, a food distribution business. So, so it's just a matter of teaching the, the AI what you're looking for, and the data is out there. Right. Anything that's ever been published in any form, these large language models are grabbing. So how then can, can you use AI? So instead of one person managing one or two transactions at a time, could could they potentially use um, a, do multiple transactions at a time? Right. And so that's kind of how, how I see uh, a team of people could do a lot more transactions, right? because they're able to use AI for all that, with one exception, and that is managing the people, right? Talking to one buyer at a time is unlikely to be changed by AI. <laughs> that still has to happen. 100%.
Would okay, so business brokerage is that like the step one to eventually launching your own MA firm, or um, there's no like chronological order? What's the difference between each to have as a business, and why would you recommend to have your firm of either a business brokerage firm or an MA um, advisory and or yeah, an MA advisory firm? Yeah, I'd say the the principal. I mean, fundamentally, you're, everybody's doing the same job, right? They're selling one company that's owned by someone to someone else. Now, I would say most business brokers, not all, but most, tend to sell a business that's owned by an individual and it's going to be purchased by an individual. So one-to-one, -one, if you will. Where uh, And those transactions tend to be usually two or three million dollars US or lower. Sometimes they own involve real estate too so that can change the financial metrics but not necessarily um, and most of the businesses tend to be marketed because it, they're going to an individual right not to a, another company they tend to be marketed publicly anonymized but publicly through these very large you know uh, business for sale portals mergers and acquisition firms are like mine we tend to sell smaller companies to larger companies so if i'm going to sell a five million dollar company I'm going to target companies that are 25 million, 30 million, 50 million. Um, and you don't need to have an advertising portal. What you need is the ability to call and to email and to get through to the right buyers. Um, so it kind of depends what you want and also depends what credibility you bring to it. Um, a lot of people can get some good training to, you know, as I did. And you, and you work at a business broker and you kind of learn the learn the process and then what you tend to do is people tend to go up market because if you think of the amount of time it takes to sell a five hundred thousand dollar business it's really not that different the amount of time it takes to five or ten million dollar business and you make more money so that's what oftentimes people go up market from business brokers to m to m a companies love it well paul thanks for the value you've shared today where can people find out more about you Sure. Uh, if you go to um, tnag.org, truenorthadvisorsgroup.org, I'd um, be happy to talk to you anytime or reach out to me on LinkedIn at Paul F. Cronin.